Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. If you are a regular listener of First Person Plural, you know that at the end of our show each week, we direct you to our website called Cultural Construction Company. While this might sound like the name of a business, it is not. It is simply a website, a space we've carved out online to think about some issues that are important to us. The website links to personal and professional pursuits, and it will continue to grow in these directions. We have designed the site this way on purpose because we believe that the ways most people divide their lives into such compartments as family, friends, business, and profession can be misleading. Life ain't that neat. Life is fuzzy, blurry, overlapping. Cultural Construction Company is meant to reflect that fuzziness. While the site has blurred boundaries, it is not without a central theme or value. Through Cultural Construction Company, we are concerned with culture. We don't define culture, but we do reflect upon the ways in which culture intrudes into our lives and the ways in which we contribute to the culture around us. Oh yeah, and we try to find ways to create culture on purpose. Say, for instance, by producing a radio show. Why be concerned about culture? Because we have become convinced that culture is the place where power is shaped and challenged. We are no longer confident that simply protesting a cause, casting a vote, expressing an opinion, or changing a law will be enough to facilitate real change in a world that is at once locally centered and globally influenced. Even when laws are obeyed, only a change in our shared values will ensure an ongoing growth towards a world where people can be free, productive, and expressive persons. Culture is the whole of shared values that is greater than the sum of its parts. On today's show, we want to share our philosophy and we want to invite you to read some of the books that have influenced our thinking about culture and power. We will offer you a reading list, our picks, so to speak. We don't expect to impact the publishing industry as radically as Oprah did, but we wanted to do our part to fill the gap that remained after she decided to close her book club. So welcome to the launching of the Cultural Construction Company Book Club. Later in the program, you'll hear the first ten entries and be given a chance to let us know your favorite culture jam. Form Cultural Construction Company, a manifesto. We have heard it said many times that the liberation movements of the mid-20th century succeeded in changing laws, but did not succeed in changing the hearts and minds of the general population. Prejudice, discrimination, division, and hatred are alive and well in the 21st century, in spite of many rhetorical efforts to make things more egalitarian, to enfranchise previously powerless constituencies, and to inhibit systematic racism, sexism, and so forth. But since the Reagan era, there seems to be nothing left but political correctness, a hollow projection of what was envisioned when Rosa Parks refused to walk to the back of the bus. Why would all those valiant efforts fail? Is it simply because people discriminate, divide, and hate? Are we doomed to end fighting, genocide, ethnic cleansing, and terrorism, however you define it? We would seem to have little reason to believe otherwise. It does not take much to construct a very dismal view of the world. But if one scratches the surface, one finds optimistic points of view almost everywhere. Are these points of view 
simply delusional? Gramsci looked around and saw that Marx had the problem correctly diagnosed. Capitalism was creating essentially the kind of world that Marx had predicted, but that world wasn't heading towards revolution. It seemed that the worse the world got, the more the masses loved it, ate it up. Why? Why would these people act against their self-interest with such enthusiastic glee? Gramsci's answer was cultural production. Not only did owners of capital control production of capital, they also controlled production of culture. It was the owners of culture who decided what would be seen, heard, read, and experienced by the masses. It was the owners of culture who essentially taught the masses how to think and feel. And if the owners of capital controlled cultural production, it made sense that the culture reflected the best interests of the owners of capital, not those of the masses. This was not a conspiracy. This was simply people acting the way they thought was right. No collusion was necessary. Control was all that was needed. Hegemonic messages pervaded cultural constructions, and these messages reflected the interests and beliefs of those who finance and control their creations. In fact, one could argue that control of the means of information production supersedes control of the means of material production, with the former leading to the latter more readily than the reverse. We believe this is why classism has never really been addressed in all the isms that have had their 15 minutes of fame. To discuss class on any meaningful level would be diametrically opposed to the best interest of those who control media production. In a capitalist society, the illusion that haves and have-nots occupy their respective positions because of their work ethic and nothing else is a presumption that allows those who control cultural production to feel justified in their control. The House of Cards would be jeopardized if that illusion were dispelled. That is not to say that other isms have been addressed adequately. There is a tendency in U.S. culture to address these things just enough to rationalize saying something was done, but not enough to solve anything. We have laws on the books, but no dialogue in public forums. The groups controlling discourses have designated others that serve as examples of how open the system is, while different segments of others are simply ignored, or worse, ridiculed and tortured. The designated opposition is a real problem in politics. The second that your cause or group gets recognition, you are in danger of playing into the hands of the ruling powers. You become the proof that the system that you are criticizing essentially works. Audrey Lord said, the master's tools cannot be used to dismantle the master's house. We think this is what she means, in part. If we play politics in the American system without a fundamental change in the system, we simply become the designated opposition, the favorite child part of the system that those in power can point to and say, see the minority have their say. It's just that the majority doesn't want that. That's democracy. It's the best system we can have. It is important to stress at this point that we are constructing a macro level picture for convenience more than proposing an optimal model of human relationships. While it is possible to communicate a coherent and accurate narrative of power relations, these relations occur in the micro-level decisions made by ordinary people in everyday circumstances. Cultural production does not come from on high, but rather takes shape in the day-to-day -day resources upon which we draw to interact with each other. We do not want to be the designated opposition. We want something fundamental to change in the system. We want this because we're tired of being on the outside looking in all the time. We don't belong to many of the acceptable groups, but even if we did, we think we would be heartsick about the stupidity that still exists. A new channel for dialogue has to be opened, a medium suitable for the message. American democracy is failing to provide a good life for many of its citizens. We believe that we must discover and develop new discursive resources upon which we, and others, may draw to make sense of their lives. We are allowed to be consumers of culture. We can watch film and television, listen to radio, and read books or magazines with relative ease. But we cannot produce a film or television show, 
broadcast a radio show, or publish a book or magazine without approval from those who control culture. Consumption of culture is encouraged. Production of culture is not. Production of culture is the Achilles heel of capitalism. If people see, hear, or read something enough times, it becomes real to them. They use these discourses as sources of meaning. But how does one produce culture that isn't pre-approved by the owners and controllers of cultural capital? This is where alternative culture becomes important. Of course, alternatives have the same problem of becoming the designated opposition as political groups, but less so. Attempts to co-opt alternative culture exist, of course, but that is the battleground of culture. Alternative producers seek to provide other voices. Popular culture often absorbs those efforts. But unlike politics, the pre-designated majority doesn't rule in this battle. Every time the owners of capital absorb or co-opt something of alternative culture, it changes mainstream culture a little. It cannot point to alternatives and announce them as simply the minority opinion and then proceed to absorb them. Witness how a queer culture has seeped into mainstream culture. Will and Grace is one of the most popular shows on television. Several shows have regular gay characters. A topic where discussion was completely unthinkable 40 years ago is commonplace in prime time now. Producing alternatives provides consumers with a choice. But we hope to do more than provide a choice. We hope to provide places where others can consciously produce culture. Actually, everyone does produce culture. The problem is that most of us do this with little thought, and we often reproduce what we have seen and heard. Every time we tell another person about the great movie we just watched, or discuss the plot line to our favorite sitcom or soap opera, we are reproducing culture. In order to open a space for constructing culture, we need some rupture in our reproducing activity. That is why deconstruction will consequently be part of the effort to find new cultural construction. Deconstructing culture is cultural production because the deconstruction becomes a discursive resource upon which meaning can be drawn. Cultural Construction Company is an internet project dedicated to all things cultural. It will offer critiques of mainstream culture. It offers alternatives to mainstream channels of media. It offers links to other alternatives. It offers consumers a chance to become producers. The idea is to become a producer of culture and not just a consumer. It is cultural creativity with a self-reflexive conscience. All things social and cultural are creations of human beings. We are all cultural producers because we construct our lives and how we think about our lives with every action and reaction we make. CCC is an attempt to do what we are doing anyway, but to do it on purpose, in a self-reflexive manner. CCC is an attempt to invite others to gaze upon the process as well as the result. CCC is an attempt to be a player in a different game than mainstream cultural creation. In fact, it is an attempt to create a new game. Where we will end up is difficult to say. Staying fresh and on top of things is an important part of what we will be doing, so we see this as an organic experience. We don't want to reinvent the wheel but we also don't want to stop growing. We also see it as rhizomatous growth in that CCC will change as it connects with other efforts similar to it. Thus predicting where we will end up is like predicting where grass will stop growing. It is too complex to predict. The internet seemed a perfect place to start because production of culture on the internet is less controlled than it is anywhere else in American culture and because the internet is international with access to something other than American productions. Access is still limited by the technological equipment available to us within our means. We recognize that while we want to create an alternative, we are stuck with creating it within a box. We cannot get outside the box. But the internet is full of optimists such as us, people who are trying something different who are making cultural alternatives. The trick will be connecting us all together in something of a critical mass, 
something that will fundamentally change the dominance of capitalist culture. But we do not see our activities ending at the internet. Culture can be produced on multiple levels in multiple places. Every word we utter both reifies something in culture and changes something in it. We are part of the tide that is seen from hindsight as culture, that is, as normative. Thus, we cannot predict with any accuracy where we will go, only assess where we've been and how influential we've become. This is part of the self-reflective conscience of CCC. So to sum this up, we see CCC as an adventure upon which we are interested in embarking because we are tired of playing the political and economic games that simply force us to act in the best interest of those in control of capital. We have little capital to control, but we plan to use whatever resources we have to do something different, to ask different questions, to create alternatives. This is a new phase of our lives, and we welcome it. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. No project is without an influence, and our influences include books. Yes, we are outing ourselves as readers. What better way to present our ideas than to share with you those sources that help shape them? In the next few minutes, we will share with you our top 10 cultural studies reads. Editor Stephen Duncombe divides the essays and excerpts in his Cultural Resistance Reader into several sections. One of them is entitled, a politics that doesn't look like politics. These books fit that description. There are many differences among these books, but they have one thing in common. They are concerned with combating the onslaught of commercial interests that shape contemporary culture. So grab your pencil and paper to write down titles and authors, or better yet, visit our website culturalconstructioncompany.com to find the Q. Introducing Cultural Studies, written by Jadan Sadar, illustrated by Boren Van Loon. Published in the UK by Icon Books, in the US by Totem Books, and by Who Knows Whom in Canada, the Introducing series surveys a number of heady topics in a lavishly illustrated format. Readers wanting light but not insubstantial overviews of such topics as post-feminism, post-modernism, and semiotics will find them herein. The book tends to be written from a British point of view, but for North Americans that can be enlightening. True to the iterative spirit of textual analysis, the book offers critiques of the critiques it sees fit to include, including a proviso about queer theory that appears on pages 152 and 153. A need was felt for a critical theory that linked gay affirmation with broad institutional change. The result was queer theory, which settled into universities as the main sites of gay and lesbian discourses. Queer theory has been criticized for availing its own ethical base. Queer theorists, so the critics argue, have not provided an alternative social and moral articulation of difference. Moreover, the historical in queer theory is reduced to the modern West, or the period 1880 to 1980, in modern Western societies. This means that non-Western cultures are almost totally ignored in queer theory. Indeed, many queer theorists seem to be unaware that anything exists outside California. Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde Lorde is often quoted by cultural critics and cultural activists. Her articulate outline of how poetry, the personal, and the political meld together into subversion of dominant paradigms was most eloquent in this collection of lectures and essays. The following quote is from excerpts of comments made by Lord in New York, September 29, 1979. 
and are found on pages 112 and 113. Those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable women, those of us who have been forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to stand alone, unpopular and sometimes reviled, and how to make common cause with others identified as outside the structures in order to define and seek a world in which we can all flourish. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own gain. They will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And this fact is only threatening to those women who still define the master's house as their only source of support. Simone de Beauvoir once said, It is in the knowledge of the genuine conditions of our lives that we must draw our strength to live and our reasons for action. I urge each one of us here to draw down into that deep place of knowledge inside herself and touch that terror and loathing of any difference that lives there. See whose face it wears. Then the personal as the political can begin to illuminate all our choices. No logo taking aim at the brand bullies by Naomi Klein. Klein exposes the new face of corporatism. There exists an elite that seeks to control the ways and means of symbolic communication itself. Their modus operandi is introduction and promotion of commercial symbols meant to supersede all other content and all other uses of media and communication spaces. Familiar archetypes of anti-corporate texts are present, including consumers being trained to purchase whatever they are told, and sweatshops whose workers have no access to remedy when their employers treat them arbitrarily, but Klein's twist on the subject is the pursuit by multinationals of strategies designed to impose their trademarks and other proprietary snippets onto culture itself and indeed to have overriding considerations attributed to such intellectual property. Counter efforts have already begun and Klein notes many of them and their assessments of the practical nuances of corporate branding strategy. The resistance is well aware of the implications of paid speech taking precedence over free speech with one of the more direct statements favoring direct action appearing on page 280. Streets are public spaces, ad busters argue, and since most residents can't afford to counter corporate messages by purchasing their own ads, they should have the right to talk back to images they never asked to see. In recent years, this argument has been bolstered by advertising's mounting aggressiveness in the public domain, the ads discussed in no space painted and projected onto sidewalks, reaching around entire buildings and buses, into schools, onto basketball courts, and onto the internet. At the same time, as discussed in No Choice, the proliferation of the quasi-public town squares of malls and superstores has created more and more spaces where commercial messages are the only ones permitted. Adding even greater urgency to their cause is the belief among many jammers that concentration of media ownership has successfully devalued the right to free speech by severing it from the right to be heard. The McDonaldization of Society by George Ritzer Ritzer is arguably the most accessible sociologist. Almost every sociology student in North America has been assigned his comprehensive theory survey, and so it is no surprise that Ritzer knows social theory. What is surprising is that he can take that social theory and make it readable by relating it to the problems of everyday life, such as the ways in which McDonald's philosophy has invaded other cultures and other realms of North American culture. The following quote is found in his chapter on the, quote, frontiers of McDonaldization, close quote, in which he takes a look at trends in birth, death, and death-defying acts to demonstrate the extent to which the rationalizing philosophy of McDonald's has embedded itself in our everyday lives. It is found on page 161. 
the funeral business has apparently adopted still another lesson from the fast food industry, that what it is really selling is fun. Quote, somber boohoo funerals with loved ones weeping at the grave seem to be going out of style, close quote. One family, for example, planned a beach party memorial service. The Japanese, doing the United States one better, are planning a death amusement park modeled after that key element of McDonaldized society, Disney World. An Osaka undertaker is already putting together quite a show. A coffin on an electronically operated cart moves down a 50 meter hill, bathed in the light of laser beams and accompanied by chanting monks and the family of the deceased. When it reaches the end of the hall, which was once a bowling alley, the coffin enters a semicircular tunnel enveloped in a thick fog of dry ice and disappears into the other world. There is an example of a themed mausoleum under construction in Canada. Atop the 110 foot high edifice, mourners will be able to watch loved ones being cremated on a pyre overlooking the city. Below will be theme floors, one for Catholics with a nativity scene, a floor for Buddhists with statues and incense burners, one for the Canadian military veterans with medals and weaponry, and a simulated tropical island with palm trees and piped in ukulele music for late members of Vancouver's substantial Fijian community. White Trash, Race and Class in America edited by Matt Ray and Anna Lee Newitz of Bad Subjects Online Zine. This collection of essays looks at the concept of whiteness from a number of different angles relating to class. Since whiteness is often equated with wealth and non-white equated with poverty, this reader breaks down both race and class by marking both in ways not usually done in sociological circles. It does so with humor as well as wit. The following quote is from an essay written by Laura Kipnis and Jennifer Reeder called White Trash Girl about a performance art project by Jennifer Reeder on page 115. This was White Trash Girl's project to deploy the classed and improper body onto the art world at large. Because while art world habitues may plat at poverty chic and disdain bourgeois conventionality, class hierarchies are still entrenched and rigid and the wrong class origins or the wrong sort of anti-style still mark you as the interloper, the gatecrasher of the citadels of culture. Hence the birth of White Trash Girl, invented just to disembobulate the fairly unexamined social relations of the art education biz. Nobody fucks with White Trash Girl, she fucks with you. She's a mean mama with a scatological sensibility, a right hook, skin thick as cheap vinyl when it comes to public opinion. Fuck me? No, fuck you. Commodify Your Descent, The Business of Culture and the New Gilded Age, edited by Thomas Frank and Matt Whelan. This collection of reprints from The Baffler is an irreverent look at business and culture. Aptly describing their essays as salvos, they take shots at much of the commodification of culture with hits designed to sink. The following is an excerpt from a fake business research report recommending the purchase of stocks in a fake company which sells deviants with such brand names as Subcults and Grunge, created by Frank Thomas and David McCulhey on page 74. Overview of Operations Consolidated Deviance's business, simply stated, consists of translating disparate subcultural signifying practices into easily identifiable and marketable lifestyle consumption configurations known as the company's trademark, subcults, trademarked. The company's staff of lifestyle experts, researches, invents, and tests a wide variety of such configurations concentrating specifically on such market-proven attributes as, quote, attitude, close quote, quote, authenticity, close quote, and, quote, street credibility, close quote. And although CONDEV intends to positively impact the homogenization and centralization of cultural authority nationwide, the company has found the greatest measure of success, ironically, 
is the heavy marketing of the musics, looks, and accessories of, quote, local scenes, close quote. These geographically particular subcults, trademarked, are presented to the national market as deeply indigenous and therefore, quote, authentic, close quote, expressions of grassroots alienation. The Onion presents Our Dumb Century, 100 Years of Headlines from America's Finest News Source, edited by Scott Dickers. In a society that has tried very hard to make a joke of the media, a joke media source can be valuable. Dickers and his staff have created a book of retroactive, very similitudinous page ones for their famous parody periodical. The work echoes the similar but serious New York Times end of the 20th century volume. A typically fanciful yet barbed item appears on page 114, the August 10, 1969 issue of the falsely venerable newspaper. Nixon orders nation's youths arrested. Washington, D.C. President Nixon ordered the nation's approximately 50 million young people arrested Saturday, charging all Americans between the ages of 13 and 25 with criminal trespass, disturbing the peace, and sedition. America's youths have proven increasingly dangerous to the stability and security of the U.S., Nixon said. The only safe option is to detain them indefinitely. Nixon said the young people's repeated anti-war demonstrations, draft dodging, bra burning, unchecked hair growth, and slang use have reached crisis proportions and must be stopped. Prisons across the country are expected to suffer overcrowding as the nation's adolescent population is incarcerated. Officials are requiring all young people to report to local jails for temporary holding until federal prison space is allocated. Federal marshals have been enlisted to hunt down all young adults who refuse to report voluntarily and have orders to shoot on sight any unauthorized young person. Said Nixon, these grave security risks must be contained, at least until they are old enough to behave. The Bust Guide to the New Girl Order, edited by Marcel Karp and Debbie Stroller. What separates the women from the girls? Boobs, no doubt. Karp and Stroller were an important part of the zine revolution in the early 1990s, and this book has the best of breasts. This project is a great example of what has come to be called New Feminism. The following quote is an excerpt from the Manifesto of Bust, found in the front of the book, and it sums it up nicely. But somewhere, somewhere in our girl brains, the idea had been planted. When we were young, when we watched the Brady Bunch, when we were forced to take homemaking while the boys took shop, that we would, of course, be married to successful men and be ready to have families by the time we were, well, at least definitely by the time we were 30. Instead, we find ourselves nearing or past 30, still in dating hell, still trying to figure out our sexual identities, still sleeping too late, forgetting to do the fucking laundry and wearing dirty underwear, not knowing how to cook, worrying about the electricity being turned off again, being in debt to our creditors, not having any savings, and hearing the tick, tick, tick of our goddamn biological clocks. When we were in our early 20s, we thought that the biological clock and juggling career and family stuff was yuppie bullshit for women who wore beige stockings or relaxed their hair. We knew better. We would figure it all out in our own radical bohemian thrift store ways. Surely it would happen to us, and it hasn't. We haven't figured it out, and now here we are. But look around you. There are a lot of us here, lots and lots of us. It's not just me. It's not just you. There are a whole heap of us, late 20s, early 30s, groovy girl women, and we need to hear each other. We need to help each other. We need to laugh at each other. We need to speak at each other. So speak. We want to read you. We want to recognize ourselves and laugh. We want to have fun. We want to get mad. We want to bust. Love the left one and the right one. The Happy Mutant Handbook, Mischievous Fun for Higher Primates, edited by Fraunfelder et al. So you're one of those creative people, and you're trapped on Earth with a bunch of organization men 
and perpetually depressed artsy types. Despair not, there is another lifestyle option at your disposal. The editors of Boing Boing, a zine of no fixed paradigm, provide tidbits on culture jamming, crediting the band Negative Land with coining the term, advanced techniques in prank phone calling, the Reverend Ivan Stang of the Church of the Subgenius, praised to Bob, using computers to all sorts of aesthetically scary ends, and even the Happy Mutant Hall of Fame, featuring, among others, William M. Gaines, the late publisher of Mad Magazine. Gaines's Hall of Fame biographical sketch is written by frequent contributor Carla Sinclair and appears on page 23. All you need is the Watt Me Worry philosophy and you'll be smiling as wide as the gap-toothed redhead who coined that phrase, Alfred E. Newman. Okay, so Alfred was just a cartoon mascot for Mad Magazine, but William M. Gaines, co-creator of Mad, along with Harvey Kurtzman, was a real character who had real fun. The fun began at Educational Comics, owned by Bill's father, Max Gaines. Soon after Bill got a job at EC as a gopher, his dad died in a boating accident. Bill then took over the company, changed EC to Entertaining Comics, and revolutionized not only the world of comics, but American humor as well. Beginning with The Crypt of Terror and The Vault of Horror, in 1950, Gaines launched a new genre of comic books, horror and suspense. EC's grisly tales clutched the imaginations of American youth, and comic book sales boomed at an astounding rate. Unfortunately, the media was already worshipping a name-calling, finger-pointing morphine junkie by the name of Joe McCarthy, who flew into a fanatic rage over these grisly tales. Humans were squirming with devilish delight over these comics. They were having too much fun. Paranoia was très chic, and by 1954, McCarthy's gang put an end to Gaines's line of horror comics. Gaines had already launched Mad Magazine, however, so he just shifted gears, and yet another genre was born, the American Satire Magazine. Mad poked fun at other comic books and any two or three dimensional character who happened to be in the way. It was a tremendous success. Its dramatic impact on American humor influenced bigwigs such as Saturday Night Live, 60s cartoonist Robert Crumb, satirical films like Airplane and Naked Gun, and my own Boing Boing magazine. Although he left this planet in 1992 after circling the sun 70 times, the happy mutants of the world will be here to perpetuate his what me worry attitude. Fat so because you don't have to apologize for your size by Marilyn Wan. The most fun to be had reading, Wan takes on the diet and fitness industry, the fashion industry, and the medical establishment with excerpts from her zine put together in a cohesive book. Because fat hatred is so deeply entrenched in our culture, this book necessarily culture jams including fat trading cards and a beautiful Venus of Willendorf paper doll, complete with clothes that fit. The flabulous Marilyn addresses the weight question on pages 122 through 123. If there were a fat homeland somewhere on the world map, we might not have this problem. If there really had been, a golden fat era when fat was worshipped, we wouldn't be in this bind. I'm sorry, but a couple of European painters and one prehistoric statuette don't constitute a golden era. If fat children were only born to fat parents and thin people only came from thin families, then our glorious fat heritage passed down through the generations might save us from this situation. As it is, there is no official language of fat pride. There are no fat slang words, no fat neighborhoods, no fat holidays, no traditional music of fat people. There is no comforting and familiar fat cuisine, no special dance that fat people dance when they are happy or sad, no fat hairstyle, no, no rite of passage for fat children to undergo other than the teasing. There is, in short, no fat culture. Although there is not yet a fat culture, we do have a fat community. Fat organizations and newsletters, books and magazines, conventions and parties, clothing stores and dating services, and thousands of people who either create these resources or use them. Given that the mania for thin only really flourished in the last 100 years, and given that fat people only started to resist that mania in an organized way about 25 years ago, we have accomplished a lot. 
Still, fewer than one-tenth of one percent of America's 97 million fat people are out of the closet and actively enjoying fat community. Fat people are staying in the closet because they cling to the false hope of one day passing for thin and because there is not yet a fat culture to welcome them home, to welcome us home. Don't worry, it's coming. Fat people would lead normal, happy lives full of the usual mix of love, work, family, friends, and car payments. And on National Fat Day, everyone, fat and thin, would slick their hair back, don the traditional orange and pink kilts, and take to the streets in the fat parts of town to dance the belly bossa nova until dawn. Fat culture, here we come. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvig.ca. Giving sociology an edge! For those of you not familiar with her past, Patty was an instructor at the University of Florida while she was in graduate school there and made a habit of assigning books to her students. Lots and lots of books. That is part of the inspiration for this segment. I used to assign books even before I taught. Yes, but only to me. No, to other people too. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yes, I, I like telling people what to read. You're like a walking annotated bibliography. What can I say? I'm one of those readers. One of those card-carrying readers? Yes, a card-carrying reader. I even have two or three cards that allow me to read. That's another reference to The Onion, America's Dumb Century, or whatever the title was. Now that I've done the segment, I've forgotten the title. There's an article in The Onion in one of their fake retro issues about... Joe McCarthy targeting the book reader menace, having taken care of the communists, now he's moving on to bigger and better things. And he describes public libraries where card-carrying members get together to engage in book reading and other related activities. But I like to encourage reading, and I also like to share good books. And I have to own up to a really bad book habit. That habit being reading or purchasing books? Well, both. You can't have one without the other. Okay, so you have not in fact heard of the public library. Sure, you go to the library to figure out which books you want to purchase. Oh, oh, oh. Well, let's indulge you then. If you could have assigned an 11th book, what would it have been? I actually debated about a book called The Cultural Resistance Reader, edited by Stephen Duncan. This book, I don't know, it's got probably over 50 articles in it, or excerpts from other books, and I like the way that he organized it, and I especially like the idea of cultural resistance. That sort of shaped the way I thought about the other books, so I ended up using it not so much as a book that I would recommend, because it's not as accessible as the books that we put on the list. I made a criteria on the list that it be accessible, that it be something that you don't have to have a PhD in order to be able to read and understand what the people are saying. So So you're targeting the intelligent layperson? Well, yeah, or at least somebody who is interested in culture. Um, And there are a lot of people out there. I mean, I think that there's a good number of activists who are beginning to understand that the battle is on the culture front and not on the political front per se. There's this thing called culture jamming and culture jamming is defined in many different ways in different places that I've seen. To me it's about critiquing the culture and looking for ways in which you can kind of turn cultural symbols back on themselves. Uh, Ad Busters over in Vancouver is a real good example of culture jamming where they take logos of different companies and change the logo 
in order to get their message across. So they're using the same symbology. In fact, they're relying upon you as a consumer to recognize the symbology that they have appropriated, but they inserted a different message. So it's subversive. It can be, yeah. Well, subversive is a strong word. Is it critical? Yeah, it's critical. I mean, the one that comes to mind that I've read recently is taking a pack of cools and changing the K to an F. So you're seeing the cigarette ad as it is, and, you're, and everything's in place, the same colors, the same writing, the same font that's in the ad itself, except because they changed the K to an F, it creates a whole different message. And it's subtle, but it's, but it's definitely a critique of cigarettes are not cool. Cigarettes make you a fool. So they keep the font, the color scheme, uh, the art, and so forth, and they change one or two little elements so that the association is sure to remain. So the idea is that it essentially jams up the message. It stops the message in its track. So it that's, gets associated with it in any case. Yes. But it also stops it. I mean, I think the word jam has a double entendre in culture jamming. One is that it's, it's innovative or, or improv, an element of humor, an element of fun to it, an element of spontaneity. So that kind of jamming, that sense of improvisation, is associated with culture jamming. And thus the word jam, which is you know, what musicians talk about when they're, when they're doing improvisation, they say that they're jamming. But the other part of that is sort of the log jam, the, the thing that gets it stuck in the system and makes it stop in its tracks, so to speak. That's what culture jamming is supposed to be, is sort of stop a cultural message in its tracks and, and either reroute it or, or cre keep it from moving on. So it's like a virus, but instead of attaching to a microorganism, it attaches to a meme. Yes, exactly. To use Dawkins' term for the eighth consecutive week, I believe. <laughs> sometimes it attaches a new message, it replaces the message, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's just meant to stop it. You know more about the roots of the term than I do. The term culture jamming? Yeah. I've seen in two different sources now. Uh, one was the Happy Mutant Handbook and the other was No Logo, both of which curiously appear on our top ten list, that the band Negative Land in the 1980s coined the term, first associated it with this sort of activity. I know that the band Devo was doing this sort of thing, although they were not using the term for it. Mark Mothersbaugh has been interviewed in several places, and he said that one of the things Devo tried to do was stick in these little associational things, some purposefully, some just out of lighthearted mischief. <laughs> and they did so through many media. Music was one of them, video was another, and they even pursued print at one point. They did home videos, all sorts of things. It was a project to them. They were all art students from Akron, Ohio, and they got bored and decided to start doing this sort of thing. You brought up the word subversive before, and I think this is an interesting question. Are these people who do this kind of thing trying to subvert some sort of system? Are they merely offering an alternative? I don't know how you could trace intent. I would guess that the subversive and the alternative are both lumped into the same category by the big kids, the people whom ad busters busts. I would guess that to them there is no difference. Whether well, it's a deliberate attack on the cool cigarettes of the world, or whether it's just Devo trying to put some silly images in your mind for the sake of artistic value, one way or the other I would guess that the big kids consider it a threat. And sometimes that's valid and sometimes that's just the big kids problem. I've heard you talk about not liking the word subversive before. I don't think it's necessary. I think that alternative can exist. You can't trace intent, but you can postulate that there are areas, and this sort of thing especially, symbolic communications, where intent is absent. I think that's safe at least. I think the fact that the mere attempt to create culture is becoming more and more associated with an opposition to, quote, free enterprise, close quote, is threatening indeed. 
I think it is almost definitionally an attack on free speech. I would use an indirect proof or indirect argument, I would say. If this is not considered an attack on free speech, an attack on the very principles, the first principles of free speech, what would be? Mm -hmm. Being told, no, no, you just can't do that, is extreme. Or being told, no, no, we own those words. I think the ownership of words has been a very interesting phenomenon in the last 15, 20 years. Words and phrases and sentences. Yeah, the trademark thing where... You deserve a break today. You deserve a break today is trademarked. I and think so was a diamond is forever at one point. I think that was a De Beers slogan in the late 40s. Yeah, but a diamond is forever is not something that people necessarily say in everyday conversation. But you deserve a break is is normal conversation and to have that trademarked I mean the next thing you know we're going to be charged royalties every time we mention anything one of the few people to fight this successfully was William M. Gaines whom I mentioned in the earlier segment as being one of the people whom the Happy Mutant Handbook places in their Hall of Fame one of the things that Mad Magazine did quite often was take the music to a popular song, or at least reference it, and write new lyrics to it, which we've all done. Al Yankovic has made a career of it. But Gaines had done this for a while, and he got sued by a bunch of major music publishers, and he defended himself, and he won. Yeah. Well, I say he defended himself. He didn't. He, he, he put together a defense. I'm sure that he had attorneys do the heavy lifting. But essentially, his argument came down to, in his words, if I step out of the shower whistling, smoke gets in your eyes, I don't have to send a two cent royalty to Jerome Kern for it. And he made it stick. I wonder if he could make it stick today as easily as he did then though. No. I don't think he could. <laughs> well, one of the reasons that we looked at these books and why I've been thinking about culture jamming lately is because of our bigger project, Cultural Construction Company. And I've been asking myself, is Cultural Construction Company a form of culture jamming? In some ways, I think it is. For one thing, the use of the word company. I mean, we purposely put it as a .com, not a .org or a .net, though we do own those domain names as well. But we put it as a .com and use the word company as a play on that word. Company has come to be associated with a legal entity called corporations. But in truth, company also means a group of people hanging out. I mean, you have company over. You have people over to your house. It's a social word that has to do with hanging out together for a common purpose. And so our intention on looking at, at using the words cultural construction, construction company, and the, and the word company was all meant as a kind of cult, culture jamming. But since then, I've kind of thought of us as more cultural creatives, more people who think in terms of creating culture, like having a radio show. But other things too, I mean we put pictures up, we put um, our writing up, we blog, all of this other kind of stuff is connected with the website and certainly as we move on there'll be more of it. And I think that that underscores the subversive versus alternative distinction and nomenclature. A subversive is someone who defines himself in terms of the other, and an alternative is a polite way of saying an original. Hmm. Technically, it's being defined in terms of the other as well, but in truth, its first principle is what it has to offer. been listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia, simulcasted on 104.3 cable and cfuv.uvic.ca.
First Person Plural is produced weekly by Dr. Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson. Music for First Person Plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. For more information about First Person Plural, or Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, culturalconstructioncompany.com.